and he followed us home. He drove two hours on the freaking freeway in like the opposite direction where she needed to go to ask my mother one more time if she could be my agent. Oh my God. And at that point, my mom was like, okay, maybe this kid's got something, you know? <laughs> so she asked me, you know, what I thought if it was something I wanted to do. And at that point, I thought you lived in the TV. So I was like, yeah! <laughs> That's how we started. I got stopped. Lived in the TV. What, what project? What project? Hello. 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 Is Hello. number two on him? It is. It is? How come it doesn't sound like it? It's on. Oh, maybe you muted it. It's got buttons. Mm -hmm. <gasps> no, see that? No. Hello? No. Here, I'll trade you. Hello? Mm -hmm. Here, you have that one. Okay. <coughs> You're on, right? Yeah, you're on. You're on now. I know, but she has nothing yet. Oh, she will. I'll get you. Um, <clears throat> What was I talking about? I got sex hair. <laughs> <laughs> I got that sex hair going on. Uh, sex hair? You were about to ask her a question. <laughs> oh, you were going to ask me oh, yeah. what was the, the first thing where you got your sex card? Because mm. most of you guys know it's very difficult to get into SAG. Yeah. You have to get a job that entitles you to. You get Taft Hartley first. Taft Hartley. Um, I'm guessing it would probably, I'm, I'm going in and out. I'm guess. I'm guessing it would probably be Friday the 13th, yeah? Oh, is that right? Right? Because you were how old then? Like, before that, so, so my mom let me do modeling. Um, I did modeling for like a year, or a couple of years or whatever, and then, um, I told her I wanted to do commercials, and my mom was like, oh, I don't know about that, you know, so I did a little <coughs> commercial workshop that the first national commercial and my mom was like oh my god why do i drop this kid and i was like see you mom and then friday the 13th I, I went to my mom and i was like i want to audition for movies and once again she was like i don't know jen it's really it's different than you know commercials it's different than modeling and of course friday the 13th first movie audition i ever auditioned for and i got it my mom was like damn it you stop, <laughs> you stop doubting this kid but i i think it was i think it was friday the 13th because friday the 13th kind of was the beginning of everything that was when they started my, um, you know, because of Jerry Coogan, they have the Jerry Coogan law, so when you work as a minor, when you make your first, like, big money or whatever, you have to go and stand before a judge. The judge asks you, like, oh, do you want to do this? Are your parents forcing you to have this career? Blah, blah, blah. And then they take 10% of whatever it is and they start an account because so many, you know, actors and actresses growing up end up with nothing. Well. They don't take into account that if you are a minor when you like move out and stuff and you have a client trust account with your business manager that people can still take tens of thousands of dollars from you without you knowing. Yeah. Do you remember what your do you remember what your audition was like? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I went in there and you know, we talked back and forth and then they were like, Okay, are you ready for your scene? And I was like can you give me a minute? And I walked to the back of the room and I got myself crying. And then I turned around and I started. And I think I had them. I had them right there. I was the last one in. There were so many girls. There were so many girls. And I was the last one in. And you never want to be the first one. And you never fucking want to be the last one because they're fucking done. They're done with the day. So my mom and I are like, you know, like six girls prior to like me going in. I'm talking to my mom like, I gotta do something, mom. I gotta do something. Like, oh, we didn't. You know, because we, we didn't, I didn't grow up in LA. My mom drove me two hours in traffic there and two hours back like, every day for like 16 years so I could even freaking do it. So I'm like, oh man, my mom put so much, you know, she was going through cancer, going through chemo, still driving me. Freaking, my mom's a saint. And um, so like, my mom's like, you know, just do you, just take a moment. And that moment got it. Wow. Yeah. How did, how did you find out you had gotten the job you just called? Right after, or? I don't remember. No. I don't remember, because I was up for a couple of other things, and I was a little bummed that I didn't get them at that same time. There was like a, it's a little like mini series called Elvis and Me, and I like really wanted. So like, at that time period, like a little distorted. Yeah, a little distorted. 
but we did part seven together and then we did Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 together. Yeah, and they uh, surprised me. The director was like, we have a surprise for you today. And I was like, yeah. I was like I'm like, I'm like 12. I'm like, what, what kind of surprise did they have for me? Like, this is weird. And I had this one little stunt up on this high gaffle and they were like, they brought out Kane and they were like, this is who we have for your stunt coordinator. And so that was like super sweet, you know? They were, yeah, and every, the fact that like everybody was super geeked for us to like see each other again and like, you know, it just makes you feel really special, wow. you know? So did you guys work together a lot on Friday? Because you know, it was just one scene. Did you have a good amount of time together when you were working? Um, did I kind of try to somewhat avoid too much? No, I can't remember. Kate, Kate was amazing, you guys. So they had me come down to set to do wardrobe, and then they had to take pictures in the house to have around the house. You know what I'm talking about? So I came in to do those, and Kane was doing like a scene with the mask off, and you had told them that you wanted me to see you with the mask off because you didn't want me to be scared at the premiere when the mask came off. This guy, he doesn't even, I don't, I don't know if he's like playing humble or if he just doesn't remember like how rad he has been Aww. throughout the years. But he also invited my little brother, who was like eight years old at the time. They were gonna be exploding this building. So he invited us to come to set. I didn't have any scenes or anything, just so we could watch the explosion. And then the building really caught on fire. <laughs> so my little eight-year-old brother's just like, wow. <laughs> you know, and like, for Kane to do that for my little brother, like, man, my, brother, my little brother thought about Kane a lot growing up. You know what I mean? Like that meant a lot to an eight-year-old little boy. And then once we got to Alabama, I, I almost kept dying because I didn't know tennis streets, didn't have the right of way, so I almost got hit by a car trying to cross the street. Our hotel was not ready when we first got there. And there was it was snowing. It was supposed to be set in summer. There was icicles hanging from the from the buildings. There were alligators in the water the day before that I was actually in that they had to like get an alligator wrestler to come and. They put us in this seedy motel. There was no freaking heat. My mom called down. She's begging for like some kind of heater. We slept in the bed with a space heater under the blankets. I don't know how we didn't freaking become an inferno. And then the next day, they took us to this beautiful resort. It was so freaking nice. And um, everything was like pretty peachy keen for then, except for when we were seeing, doing our scene, or the scene where I killed my dad. And King had to come save me. They had hired actual divers that were in full dive gear to dive in just in case they had to cut the tow line so they could hold the boat. So I didn't go drifting downstream. Well, sure as shit, they could see the tow line. So it was like, cut the tow line. There were moccasin snakes in the water and the divers didn't want to get in. You're in full gear, that's your one job. I'm 10 years old and they didn't want to get in the water. So of course you know me, being me, I'm a bye mom. Hi! And my mom said, Jennifer! Jennifer! So Kane, I don't even know where he found him. He just starts looking. I can see him off in the distance. You know, it's dark, but I can, I can see, you know, somebody's like, we gotta do something. He comes up with like a piece of, like a big old piece of wood and a stick. And he just grabs me out of the boat, puts me on the little freaking plank or whatever, and gets me back to save my freaking life. Oh. You know, because hey. it's hard to imagine, but the water we were shooting in was supposed to be a lake, but it was not a lake. It was a bayou, which but that's why there was current. That's why there were so many creatures, because it was not a lake. Uh, and uh, it was a lot more difficult than we anticipated with a lot of the water stuff. Of course, <clears throat> all the shots of, at the beginning of the movie of me underwater chained to the bottom of the lake before, you know, I get uh, able to come up to the surface. That was all done in a diving pool, uh, scuba diving training pool in, uh, in, in interior, and it was dressed underneath the water to make it look like a lake and stuff. But that part was certainly not nearly as dangerous, but it wasn't easy either because I had to be um, actually connected to the bottom of the pool by my ankle with a cable held underwater and I'm breathing on a scuba system, a, a, a hookah they call it, so that I would 
I could hear John Beekler outside the pool speaking into a mic, and this is, you know, 88. So I was like amazed that I could be underwater and I could hear him talking to me so perfectly clear that it was easier. He could direct me and stuff, and he's just sitting outside the pool. And I would hold my breath, give up the regulator or to the safety diver, do the shot, and then they, he would come back in and I would breathe again. But uh, I was underwater for, I think, a couple hours at a time. Uh, it got very tiring. Uh, but I never really had to do much in the bayou uh, water at all, really. Uh, not underwater, certainly. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was, I talk about, and I, I hope this is accurate, is that this is the only film I've ever done myself where we did all of the interior shots <clears throat> in LA mm -hmm. for a month. Mm -hmm. Every shot in the movie that was interior, we shot first. Then we went to Alabama and shot all the exteriors, which is, an odd way to to do it because if you're playing a character sometimes you have to remember you know there's a shot that you did in LA at the first week of shooting and then the seventh week of shooting you do something that connects to that shot but now it's a uh, exterior so you have to remember you know the, the intensity that you had right, or the, the your performance and stuff not, not ideal, I wouldn't think, for, you know, uh, acting, especially if you have an emotional scene that you have to match or something you, you did it six weeks before, it's not easy. Um, with the stunts and the physical stuff, not quite as hard, but um, it was just uh, such a good memory for me because, you know, I'm a stunt guy. I never thought I'd sign an autograph for anyone ever. It wasn't the point of getting into the business. So um, when that started to happen, I was like, wow, this is a whole different thing. I get to do the stunts and people want me to sign stuff. It's like kind of ideal, you know? So I've always appreciated and realized how fortunate I have been. Now, I, it isn't, I don't call it luck because I busted my ass to get to that position, but I was also fortunate enough to impress the right people. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that's it's good. my favorite quote. I'm use that. It's true though, I'd right? say that I originated it. Sorry. <laughs> 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 so, before I turn it out to our audience, I wanted to talk to you guys both about Dirty Manboy. I love it so much. Uh, you guys, speaking of emotional scenes, had an emotional scene. It was beautiful. Can you share? Can we talk about that experience? So, can I go first? Can I go first? Oh my gosh, you guys. King had everybody cry. My dad was there. My papa was in tears. The entire room. He had, we were just, the floodgates opened. It was one of the most beautiful moments, and I was so grateful, I'm gonna cry right now, just to be like in that moment with King where he got to not be the monster for once, and got to to really like show what he's made of, and man, did he show up for that scene. Uh, well, thanks, I, I've always, you know, up until that point, I, I, I always wanted to have a more involved scene where I could show some emotion because for some reason I can I can do that fairly easily <laughs> um, and you know because I've always done the physical stuff and I always wanted to have that chance and then when I realized I was going to do basically a dying scene in Jennifer's arms and with our history of, you know back on Friday 7 and chainsaw and stuff, I thought, man, this is such an opportunity to show a different side. And uh, if you get a chance, take a look at uh, the movie, 13 Fanboys. She's amazing in it. And they lit me like a dick. <laughs> oh, 
I mean, you know how you're like scarred skin and she lit me from underneath. Who fucking does that to a bitch? Who does? I think mean, you know, I love her, don't get me wrong, but she like female to female, she she did me dirty guys. Dirty. But he's great. I was distracted the whole time. I what you know you ever seen somebody put a flashlight under them? Alright, even if you have perfect skin, you look scary as fuck. So you're gonna shine a big ass bright spotlight up. I was like, it's not about me. This scene's about pain. I'm not gonna say anything. I'm not gonna be a prima donna. I'm not gonna be like, can you move that light up to where it's flatter? You know? Yeah. It wasn't about me. It was his scene. You're being too hard on yourself. You were beautiful. You look great. Thank you. Well, I just feel like female to female, we should be looking out for each other. And I just feel like that was a dog ass move. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honest. Aside from being lit like a dick. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how did that project come into your life? Um, Deborah reached out to me, and the, the reason why I say that is because when I first agreed, to, before I agreed, I said, you know, I'm very insecure about my skin. Lighting and angles like really matter, and if I'm going to do something, can we make sure that we just kind of soften it? It is what it is, right? So you're not gonna like, I'm not expecting to be something I'm not, but let's. And she, you know, gave me her word that that would be okay. And so then we just kind of started talking about like maybe what my character would be like. So at first she was gonna have a yoga studio, and we were gonna have like a couple of yoga scenes. And, you That's know, interesting because I had the same thoughts about my character. <laughs> <laughs> So we went back and forth for a little while because when she first reached out to me, um, it, it, the idea was still growing in her head, you know? And did, is that how it happened with you too? Did you, did she already know what your character was gonna do and be? I, I believe so. I, we never really talked about it that much, but from my, the knowledge that I've been able to obtain about it, I think that was the case. And, uh, you know, it's, I get, the fact that I've never had any acting training, ever, I feel lucky to be able to pull off some of the stuff that I've done, and I guess this must be the case with any person that makes a living acting, is you always want to do something you haven't done before. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to do an emotional scene, and now... And he killed it! Killed it! And now uh, we're looking at uh, doing a film that is comedy. Oh, yeah. And they'd ask me not to discuss too much about it, but it would be myself and another person that's known in horror uh, as antagonistic neighbors. I'm, in, I'm here for it. Yeah. And uh, I love the script, and uh, I, I think it'd be so much fun. Um, I kind of did uh, a comedy somewhat um, in England with Bill Mosley called Shed of the Dead. And uh, it was, you know, there were some funny moments, but this new one would be just full-on comedy. Uh, and I really hope it happens, because I'd, I'd, I'd have so much fun doing it. I'm here for that. Too. Do we have any audience questions? Um, for King? Um, it's going to be a geography quiz. <laughs> <laughs> Did you start Do you have any say or input in how you feel about the movie? Like, what are your thoughts on it? Or is that your thoughts? Like, you get to say, oh, no, nah, it wouldn't work like that, or, oh, I like this better? Yes. Okay. Uh, anytime that, certainly with the Pride movies, because once I played the character once and then was asked to do it again in part eight, I felt like, okay, now nobody's ever done a second movie. So I feel kind of like this is my character now. So I was lucky enough to have three more directors that liked listening to my ideas, especially about the violent stuff. And I'm not sure what it says about me personally that Sometimes I come up with more creative ways to kill people, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, I somehow have a knack of reading something 
and maybe something pops into my mind, but wouldn't it be cool if we did this also? And if it didn't change the scene completely, the director's like kind of all for it. And uh, so many, many of the Friday kills in particular, I either added something else to it, even something small, just to make it more interesting or more uh, graphic, maybe. And uh, it, uh, I just feel like it, if it hadn't been directors that were secure enough to let me have the input, I may not have done four in a row. You know, some directors might say, um, yeah, he thinks he knows the character more than me or something, which I think I do. If you directed, if you're directing one movie and I did four, uh, I think I would know more about the character, but a director sometimes is insecure, so uh, they don't really look too highly on that. Hey, this is for Kane. So can you walk us through the planning, preparation, and process of being lit on fire and kind of talk about some of that? It's just such an incredible moment to see when you did that. Yeah, I mean, you weren't around when I was on fire, were you, on set? No. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm sure you guys all know I got burned badly doing a fire stunt when I first started in, in the stunt business in 1977. Got my SAG card in January of 77. In July, I got burned. So that obviously considerably delayed my success in my career, because I had to recover and then get back to <clears throat> a normal life. Uh, because, you know, not only when you get burned, not only is it incredibly painful, but once you heal, that's when the work begins because when your skin heals from getting badly burned, it contracts. All the scars shrink together. So I couldn't raise my arms because of the scarring underneath my armpits. Uh, my neck was even worse than this with, you know, limited mobility everywhere that you burn. So, it takes a long time, a lot of rehab, just to get back to moving somewhat normal. Is it good, Ted? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I thought you were asleep or dead. I didn't do it. That was bankroll. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's a, so once you heal and survive, then you have to work for a year of therapy to get any kind of movement back, which never comes back completely. Um, and then the third factor is that, you know, I was 22 when I got burned, and now you're gonna live the rest of your life with half your body as scars. So you get that visual reminder every single time you look in the mirror. So you've survived first, then you've got some mobility back and now you get the visual reminder every single day for the rest of your life that, oh yeah, that's right, I got burned badly. And you, you know, you have your shirt off at the pool and everybody's staring at you and you get used to it. But it's not easy. So I think I always have maybe a more compassion or understanding or something for people like myself that are not of the norm, you know, uh, and whether it's uh, people that <clears throat> suffer with physical limitations or even uh, mental stuff, somehow I identify more with people or understand more. And I guess anybody that's been through anything like that would probably be the same, but um, it's, uh, I, I can understand how difficult life can be when you don't have all the, uh, you know, abilities and, and, and stuff that a regular, and regular or normal, but a basic person might have. So, 
Um, I understand a lot more than I would have, I think. We have one here. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to piggyback off of, off of your question. I know during Manhattan, um, you had told us a story before about making suggestions to the actors about Jason. So what happened from the directors listening to your suggestions to the actors not given friends? Well, I mean, I think you're referring to Jason Goes to Hell. Yes, I'm sorry. Right. Because, you know, when I read the script, I was like, wow, oh, it's not very many days of me in the makeup because the storyline was such that the evil of Jason goes into other characters. And, uh, you know, what she's referring to is the fact that I thought if, if the essence of Jason is going to be in a different character, as a viewer, I think it would be cool as hell to see that character do something, even something small, in their performance that is reminiscent of me as Jason. Some kind of movement that I am known for and stuff, and I just thought it'd be cool to, if one of the characters who is now Jason looking totally different, of course, if they did something, even a little bit of the breathing or something that I, I think it'd be amazing to watch. Oh, that still looks like Jason, even though it's a different character because of that minor thing. And not one of the actors thought it was a good idea. And I was like amazed that nobody picked up on that. But I think they were offended sometimes. Some of them, I won't mention who, but some of them were like, and eh, they think they know how Jason should act because now it's their character basically. And yeah, not, not one thought it was good or interesting. And I was just, I wasn't mad or anything, but I was just like, man, I think we're missing an opportunity. Common sense. The whole thing was lacking common sense. It makes, it makes sense, right? It makes complete sense. sense. I have no idea how anybody would like not just be like, oh my gosh, yes, yes, you know? A posture or a breathing a or something. A, 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 yeah, a mental, mental arms, anything. And especially since that was my third film as a character, third one in a row, I would think people might They what? Uh, in Fallen, um, Denzel Washington, where they cast, you know, that's a perfect example of why it should be done that way. Oh, right, right, yeah. So, I, I guess they felt like I was trying to tell them how to act or yeah. something. I mean, I guess it is kind of that, but it's just a suggestion. Okay. That's all it was. Well, it's a little early for them to be getting territorial over the character. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> You've had for a lot longer than 20 minutes. <laughs> yes. So I'm a bit of a, an IMDb nerd, and I remember watching this movie with my dad back in the day. Fond memories now, but being completely terrified by the movie Alligator. Uh, assuming that the sewers were crawling with giant man-eating alligators and I would never go to the bathroom. But the IMDb it says you played the alligator, so I'm curious what what that means. Um, there were some scenes, you know, which by the way we shot in a like a like a a dra sewer drain almost, but it's a big. Uh, tunnel underneath the ground that we filled with water that would look like the set that they wanted it to be and water was disgusting and they asked me and this is early but you know a stuck person is more apt to be comfortable doing something where you have limited mobility and breathing and everything and they asked me to get in the alligator suit and kind of swim around for a couple <laughs> shots. What? Yeah, I, I don't know, I just think, yeah, the visual thing. And then based on that, alligator, <laughs> alligator 2 came along later and 
because of doing that first one, they gave me a role to play. I played uh, Richard Lynch's bro brother in the movie and had some dialogue and of course got killed. But um, yeah, there's a, there's a couple things on IMDb that people are just amazed. And then a lot of stuff that never gets on there that people are surprised about. We were talking about it at dinner last night. For years I did all the stunts on Days of Our Lives. And that doesn't show up on IMDb because, uh, or maybe it does partially, but not to the extent that I was involved. Because you don't necessarily get credit on a TV show if you do stunts. If you play a character, then you get a screen credit, then it shows up on IMDb. But <clears throat> um, yeah, I did a lot of a lot of fun big stunts on Days of Our Lives, and you know, I did an episode of Seinfeld once, which was amazing, but doesn't exist uh, anymore. But I did a fight scene with Kramer uh, on a bus when he, if, he, if anybody knows the show, where Kramer finds a woman's toe after a car wreck or something and puts it in a Cracker Jack box. <laughs> and gets on the bus to take it to the hospital so they can reattach it to the woman and I'm, I'm on the bus and trying to mug everybody and I get to fight with him while he's driving the bus. Um, I wish it still uh, was something you could watch but you know it's been edited down so that it doesn't exist. Kramer just talks about it now but you know so many fun things that you have, and, and sometimes when I'm at a con like this, somebody will remind me of something that I forgot I did because of that exact situation. It's not I, on IMDb, and you know, uh, it's just, uh, I guess at some point when you get as old as myself, you, your memory is faltering a little bit, which it is, so that kind of adds to the fact that I forget sometimes some of the fun stuff I've done over the years. What years were you in doing Days of Our Lives? What? What years were you on Days of Our Lives? Oh boy, uh, probably 1982 or three for about 10 years. Wow. Every, every few months they do what they call remote shooting which we would know on a film would be called location. They would go outside the studio and do some exterior stuff to add to the uh, quality of the show. And then when the ratings would come out based on that week, their ratings would be higher because they had more to offer. So a lot of the soaps started doing that. And I think that for at least 10 years, I used to play for the Days of Our Lives softball team in a Burbank City League and uh, you know I, it was so much fun like getting in altercations with other soap opera actors. <laughs> it's a damn shame that that was before Penance time because then you could have had a private reunion because Kevin Spiritus was on Days of Our for many years and I, think, I don't know maybe started in 98. Yeah, and that's when he was going by Spiritus. Yes, when he went back to his real name. Right. Yeah. Kevin Blair we're talking about, right. who was the male lead in part seven. Yeah, and Patrika Darbo played Kevin's wife on the show. Oh. Yeah, right? so we have a whole, like, theme, hatchet, Friday, like, theme. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I ever knew that. Yeah. Patrika, of course, you know as the unfortunate <laughs> woman in character that tried to run away from me in the first Hatchet movie. And I said, no, you're not getting anywhere. And I grabbed her from behind, put my hands in her mouth, and ripped her fucking head apart. <laughs> not easy to do. But, uh, and, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I love you so much, you're your friend. And so every time I get the opportunity, I got a name drop because she's awesome. And I've never met Kevin, but she says he's awesome as well. And I think it'll be so fun at these conventions to have the Patrika, Kevin, Kane, like, because we've got that whole like six degrees of days or lines going on here. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, no one listens to me though. Write a letter, okay?
You also have some soap opera credits under your belt. I do. Yeah, you got Sunset um, Beach and Pacific Palisades. Yeah, so they, cre well, so Aaron Spelling created 90210 for his daughter, Tori. And um, he created Sunset Beach for his son, Randy. Um, I went in, I, I auditioned for Pacific Palisades. I, for one episode, that's how it started. One episode. And then I had, like, you guys, I was so fucking sick. I was puking. I was I was, I had diarrhea, like it was insane. And I literally would like, just go to the bathroom, get it all out, and then I'd just be sitting there waiting for my next scene. And they were like, oh, this girl's a champ. So I get a call from my agent, and he's like, you got the movie Good Burger. And I was so excited because they had their sponsor by Adidas, and I was like, we did a shit. Keep forgetting there's kids in here, you guys are so sorry. Um, darn it. So then, then he calls back and he's like, "Oh, you you gotta you gotta pick between um, Pacific Palisades just called. They offered you eight more episodes. Oh. Eight of the thirteen of the first season. I, I guess because I was puking and had diarrhea and I, I I wasn't complaining. I was just like, oh, just bring me a book. I, I don't got the reference. Okay, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. You know." And so I had to pick between the movie and I wanted to do the movie. And like my my agent was so mad at me. He was like, no, you're not doing Good Burger over eight episodes, you know? But I, like, all I knew you guys, all I wanted was the free and Jesus stuff. That's like literally all I cared about in that, in that moment, you know what I mean? I was sick and running a fever, but... <laughs> so then I, I ended up getting married to my elementary school sweetheart, who I know since I was eight years old. He played the voice of Linus, I played the voice of Lucy, growing up in Peanuts cartoons together for like three years. He used to call me Bowie's daughter, and I was like, I'm not Bowie's daughter. And like, that's how our little thing happened when we were younger. He would like chase after me in circles, and <laughs> he was so annoying. And I married him. And um, Aaron knew that I had just gotten married and that um, we weren't getting picked up for a second season. And he fired the girl on Sunset Beach and gave me her role. Whoa. Wow. Wow. And let me ask you something, just out of curiosity. Do you think it's too nepotistic or fucked up that someone like Aaron Spelling develops a television series for his child? Do you think that's, I mean, it's a little bit much, but I'm not sure that it's that bad, really. Because if, if she's, or he, whoever it is, is talented and brings stuff to the character. I mean, what are you supposed to do? Not give your child a chance just because you don't want to say, oh, everybody's going to bitch and moan about it. But um, yeah, I personally thought Randy was very talented as an actor. He was very. Talented. He is an amazing human. He is an amazing freaking human. Yeah, there is. I don't want to get into it, but there was a lot of he. That boy had my back. I didn't see him for years, and when he saw me, the first thing he did was question to make sure that all that bad stuff that was happening was like out of my life. And like, he's like a super like healing guru guy now. <laughs> like, he's a life coach or something. Yeah, he's such a he. Man, he turned into a cool dude. Yeah, he you know he really elevated himself like spiritually, mentally, emotionally. He turned into a really cool dude. It could have gone either way. I will tell you, when he was younger, like somebody would be complaining on set, you know, about how to do it. Oh, you have no TV show, you poor dude. You know what I mean? So, like, it could have gone either way. And he, is a, he turned out to be a really rad human. I put him through some hell on set. I put him through some hell, dude. I was not right. I was not right. Well, and let me ask you something else, too. Uh, when Jennifer was telling the story before about. Uh, you know, getting married and stuff. I swear, <laughs> I thought you said, and I thought you said, yeah, so I got married and married my elementary school teacher. <laughs> but wait a minute. <laughs> See, you thought so too. I thought, what? <laughs> Doesn't sound quite right, but it wasn't. Um, I did do a TV show where I had an affair with my teacher. That's the thing I did. I don't know if it was Notre Man, The Pretender, or, or Pacific Blue, it was one of those. Yeah. I was a dirty look. That was a reminder. I, I think 
think I did an episode of Pacific Blue once. Weren't they a great cast? I love working on that show. Yeah. And, and I worked with the lady that has the different colored eyes. I forget what that's called. When you have like one blue and one brown. She was on She was on um, Boy Meets World. So I worked with her, with her on Boy Meets World when I was younger. So then when I showed Pacific Blue, it was like, you know, another one of those little reunion things. But like with Kane, they like hated it, you know? We ain't got this in Berlin 3, no. <laughs> you know, they're like, you know, for days, like, you think I'm to it. That's a great story. Yeah. Oh, okay. You are a present. You are like a present. <laughs> oh, um, when it came to talking to Adam Green when he first was developing the Hatchet films, he wanted me to play the character, and I don't think it was guaranteed that I would do it, but, um, I had had a couple of meetings with him. I knew him just from, uh, you know, working together slightly and just uh, meeting and talking about stuff. And he told me <clears throat> he was considering me to, to play Victor Crowley. And the day before, I was trying to think, how, how can I convince him more that it should be me? And, uh, <laughs> You know, I'm sitting there, I'm nervous, I'm uh, throwing up and have diarrhea. <laughs> no, not really, but, uh, and you know, Adam from the beginning said that uh, his whole dream was for me to play his character, and it was amazing to be able to have the input as to what we would do with the character and stuff, and he was open, he had, of course, his own ideas, but again, I was lucky with every director I worked with that, you know, did any kind of uh, horror film with characters like this. They always let me at least give my ideas. And then sometimes I'd say, well, it's a great idea, but it might not work because of later in the story, you know, whatever. But um, I just was very lucky to have open-minded directors. Are they knocking and fucking ghosts? It's haunted, don't you know? Yeah. Okay, so I thought I saw your hand go up earlier, did I? Oh, I was just, when you were talking about the different roles that you played, I was trying to remember the name of the one where you played a singing pizza. What? <laughs> I need to yes. Know, I need to know more about this. Uh, I think it was House yeah. Four. Was it House Four? Yeah, yeah that's Four, because of the pizza talk. Because she opens the pizza yeah. box and it's my face yeah. in the pizza singing. Yeah. Don't Sounds forget me. to eat your favorite pizza, man. <laughs> she slams it and steps it. Hey, uh, I was just wondering how it was filming Monster and how you got that role. Yeah, that was amazing. Talking about the movie Monster that Charlize there and won an Oscar for. Um, Patty Jenkins directed that movie, who went on to direct the big Wonder Woman movie. And uh, I was able to secure the stunt coordinator job on the movie. And you have to remember, this was not a big budget movie. We shot it in Florida. And uh, I was basically the stunt coordinator, but on the set, Patty Jenkins came to me and said, you know, I think you'd be a good undercover cop because we're going to shoot this scene in a biker bar and you look like you could be a biker but also an undercover cop. And I loved the idea. And she said, you're going to have a couple lines. I said, oh boy, I haven't done much dialogue at all. And when you watch the scene, I'm sitting with Charlize at the bar and I need to get her out of the bar so we can arrest her. And, um, you know, we're, we're sitting there and I'm nervous as hell because I haven't done much dialogue and watch the scene again. I'm terrible at it with my delivery of the lines. I, you know, you gotta admit when you're good, when you're not so good. And uh, I'm not happy with the performance, but the fact that I did an acting scene with someone who won an Oscar for their side of it is pretty amazing. And, you know, <clears throat> We're shooting this scene and somebody in the crew comes up to me and says, you know, this is where Eileen Warnos, Charlize's character, 
was actually arrested. I said, what? I said, we're shooting in the same exact bar where it really happened. It's called The Last Resort. Uh, and I thought, I'll ask the, the bartender owner if he, if he knows that um, that's what happened, actually, in his bar. I said, is this true that it may have happened here? He said, yeah, it is true. I owed the bar back then, too. And I said, so what we're shooting is any accuracy to it? He says, it's exactly what happened. And I thought it was amazing that we were shooting where that scene really happened, and then she wins an Oscar, and, you know, I, I, it was a little budget movie. And I thought, people, even on the set, were talking about Oscar performance by Charlize. And I'm like, I don't think anybody's gonna see this movie. It's like, <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to see this. It's a little budget. And sure enough, because of her performance, I learned a lot by observing. And I think that, for me, was the best training I could have with, with acting dialogue stuff, was watching someone who's really good in between shots. Because the rest of the crew has a job to do. But as a stunt coordinator or someone playing a small role like me, I sit around a lot watching, and I just liked watching her prepare for certain scenes that she, she purposely did not wear makeup, she wore dentures to make her teeth more crooked. She looked very much like Eileen Warnock, so. Definitely. Okay, to wrap us up, I have uh, one more question, and I would love to know, since you guys have both been in the business for a very long time, what advice would you give your younger self, knowing what you know now, entering into this business? Don't do drugs. Don't do drugs. Don't do drugs. Don't do drugs. Don't do them. Do you think you're doing yourself under the list? Fuck yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have to agree with that. Certainly, it doesn't help your career. Uh, and they babied it. They babied my addiction. Like when I would go and do like. You know, when you're going to do TV shows at once, you do like celebrity guest appearances at places, but you go to like children's hospitals and you go to youth camps and you do like stuff like that. And every time I would be flown to go do that stuff, they would have like an undercover car escorting me so that like I wouldn't get arrested like where I was. You know what I mean? Like the more fucked up I got, the more they hired. They're like, oh my God, she's such a trap. Which is great in the beginning until something traumatic happens and then it's like no fun no more and you can't just flip the switch. Uh, the, did you ever do any like of the major talk shows appearances back in the no? Um, I just, uh, I would, would have thought that all that work you were doing that you would have been on Leno or something. I like was, I don't know, I've always had like a super fear of doing one of those. I don't know, I don't know why. But like, you know how like you manifest stuff, you know, and you like, you picture yourself there and then you kind of like retrace like the steps of like where you need to take and then you know how, what you need to do to get there. Am I making any sense? It is on the weirdo. Okay, so like when I would do that, I, I could never see it. I'd always get like petrified and like my heart would start racing and I would always get scared. I don't know, I don't know why. I don't know why, but there was always like a, a block. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, after Jason Takes Manhattan came out, uh, I don't remember how I received the call, but um, I was told that Arsenio Hall <laughs> wanted me to be a guest on the show. I thought, oh, that's cool. I haven't done that before. He goes, uh, yeah, I think I want you to be a guest uh, in costume, in character. And I'm like, this stupid fuck doesn't know that I don't speak. If, when I'm in character. Obviously, that was the whole point. You could make it very funny because of that fact. And if you watch the episode, I'm actually wearing the real screen used entire costume, mask, everything from the movie. And I think that's the only time I ever did anything in the real costume other than the one time we did the, the photo shoot for People 
magazine where uh, you know who Bob Elmore is. He was one of the Leatherface performers, and we all did a photo shoot in the costumes. Bob as Leatherface, Robert England as Freddie, and his real stuff. Me as Jason, and a guy named George Wilbur as uh, Michael Myers. So it's four of us, and it was in Halloween an issue of People Magazine, but. Other than that, that's the only time I really did anything in the real costume. Uh, and it was so funny because when I got to the studio for Arsenio, he said, I talked to him before I got into the costume. He said, hey, it's great to see you. I think this will be fun. And then he says, probably the worst thing you could say to me, but he says, so when you get into the costume, I'm scared of you in the costume, so please don't fuck with me. <laughs> that is like the last thing you want to say, right? The last thing you want to say. Oh, especially with me, don't tell me that. I am going to fuck with you now. And that's why I didn't be able to watch it again. He goes to shake my hand at the end, and I grab his hand and pull him towards me, and he really was scared, jumped up. Gave him the Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Memorable clip from that entire talk show. Like, like from it to front, that's the clip that keeps circulating. That's the one that lives on. So, aside from your drugs, advice to your younger self? Well, I mean, you know, in the 80s in particular, in the stunt business, uh, cocaine was rampant, really. Because, you know, you have to remember every day, not every day, but very often if, when you're working, you got to amp yourself up to do something that might kill you. So a lot of my co-workers were doing a lot of cocaine and I watched a couple friends ruin their career because of it. So I never tried it. And I'm not trying to act like a big shot that I never did cocaine, but it is unusual, especially in stunts. And I was just afraid that I might ruin my career if I tried it. Because, you might like it. Right, exactly. I might really like it. <laughs> That's what it's designed for. <laughs> right. And, uh, I have a point. <laughs> design? Is there a design in cocaine? Absolutely. Oh. Yeah. Artisanal, gluten-free, <laughs> locally sourced. <laughs> gluten-free cocaine. What could be better? Fish scale, oh, This is not a bad for you. <laughs> All right, everyone. Keep it up. Thank you.